my cousin Boland. My father handed me the phone. I knew he would, but I'd waited patiently as Dad heard what Cousin Boland was saying about the remote topic of the family plot in Carbondale. This was small talk for Boland. He sent documents about family history to Dad with key phrases circled in what looked like charcoal pen. He was always hoping Dad would choose burial plots for each member of the Weems family in Boland's aunt's, my grandmother's, hometown. I'm certain Boland had no illusions that Dad particularly planned to yield on this matter, and I'm certain Dad had no animosity toward Boland for suggesting we move after each of our deaths to a cemetery four hours west of home. Your cousin wishes to say hello, Fred, said my father. He handed me the phone, and I said, Hello? Cousin Frederick. The voice was flat, just as I'd imagined it from the letters. Hello, I said again. The phone was kitchen yellow. Dad stood near. Bacon sizzled on the stove. It was a Saturday. Your cousin Boland, said Cousin Boland, is 68 today. It was exactly as he would have phrased it if he'd put it in one of the cramped hand letters he sent me in their thick envelopes with masking tape closing the backs. There was always a rare coin inside. Happy birthday, I said. Thank you for the coins, I added. Fifty-six years from now, Frederick, you will attain my present milestone. Have you been writing? Oh, yes. I'm writing a baseball story. I liked the last one. My sports stories were invariably about incompetent sports players who accidentally won games. After writing to Cousin Boland once about being yelled at by the other kids in gym, he replied, in handwriting I would not be able to decipher until finding it more than 40 years later, I was derided on the stickball field by a pugnacious fireplug of a pitcher. We tykes had a bad habit, universal at the time, of chewing tobacco at all public occasions. After receiving the insult, I did something I oughtn't have. I spat tobacco juice in the eye of that wise blood. One day, about a year after Boland Hosey began sending me piecemeal his entire coin collection, something he began doing because I alone, of the three baby boomer Weemses, had sent a thank you letter for the Ben Franklin 50 cent piece he'd sent each of us, he wrote in a rare instance of decipherable handwriting, I believe you are the first of this family to become an excellent writer. Cousin Boland never wrote anything I didn't want to hear. Of course, half of what he wrote, or half of what he wrote that I still have, is illegible to me. But he was pure. The arthritis he surely had could not distort his wish to exemplify kindness. We didn't talk long on the phone. I handed it back to my father, never to hear Boland's voice again except in my head when I look at the letters. I remember being miffed about six months later, after word of Boland's death reached the house, that my mother wanted me to let her place the coins in a safe deposit box. They can't be worth that much, I said. I like looking at them. You should put them in, she said. Buster Brown's dog, Tig, looked at us from his coin-shaped sticker on the side of the shoe box as the clerk took the coins into the bank's recesses. I took the box back out in my thirties. I still have the coins. I don't look at them. Sometimes I do look at one of Boland's family history packets sent to Dad, his first cousin, and see the humorous phrases next to the faces in the Xeroxed photos. The children of turn-of-the-century Carbondale look like our gang kids to me. The girls are in white frills and ribbons are in their hair. The boys look as if they'd rather play stickball. The lengthy documents about the Boland burial plot are never unfolded. My father didn't read them. Cousin Boland was only partly shaped by his hometown. If you spend your first ten years in a largish mining town, of course, I'm sure you don't forget it. But he left Carbondale when he was around the age I was when I received the first coin. He went to what an employer of mine once called the biggest small town in America, Chicago. If Boland was 68 in 1972, which he was, then he was of Chicago by 1914. By the time he died, which was in 1972, shortly after he sent me the last coin, he'd been, for decades, an employee of the Chicago Parks Commission. I have absolutely no idea of his status in that body. We have one photo of Chicago era Boland. He is alone, standing at a tilt, somehow, in what could either be a small, comfortable-looking living room or the outer room of a funeral parlor. His is the snowy hair, in this picture, of the recently retired appointee. 
The neat black suit, the tips of the handkerchief peeping over the pocket top, the polished but not gleaming shoes show a man in Sunday garb, business attire, or something else altogether. My youthful bride died yesterday, he wrote me. I suppose I did not want to hear that. He'd mentioned her in several letters the first year he wrote. I hadn't known she was ill. I'd often write, Dear Cousin Boland, I'm sorry not to have written sooner. How are you? How is your youthful bride? At the age of eleven, I was undecided as to how to answer. I typed one or two false starts. I typed on the Royal Typewriter from 1926, which my mother had given me. I emphasized startling words in red, but I had no wish to startle in this letter. In somber black letters, I typed, I am sorry to hear the news of your youthful bride. Appointees in retirement are proper, and his thank you came. In his new letter, he added a P.S. You remember me when all others seem to have forgotten. An odd anecdote about Boland Hosey comes to mind. Sometime in the late forties, after Dad got back from World War II, he visited an uncle of his, or perhaps a cousin. This was a doctor in Chicago. I can't remember, as you can tell, if this, then, was Boland's older brother, a cousin of Boland's, or an uncle of his. I'd remember if Dad had told me it was Boland's father. In any case, my father took a trip from Kearney, New Jersey, to Chicago to see his relative about surgery. Nana, my grandmother, Boland's aunt, was, though a coal miner's daughter, the sister of several doctors. She, too, grew up to be a doctor, not a typical gig for a woman born in 1891. Dad thought he needed surgery, hence he got to meet Nana's relation, who not only would perform the surgery which saved Dad's life, but who told him about the days when he'd had to look after the new denizen of Chicago, the former Carbondale, Pennsylvania urchin, Boland Hosey. After showing Dad the bullet holes in the outside wall of his office, the marks of gangland frolics of the twenties, he told Dad that ten-year-old Boland had worried him one day with the news that he'd been doing something lucrative. This nice fella has me study the railroad ticket agent. If someone who looks like this or that, you know, if he has a white hat and no glasses, or glasses and a green hat, if I notice someone like that, I just have to listen to him say what time he wants to get on the train and where he's going. I run to the other fella, and he gives me a dollar. Nana's relative, Dad's cousin or uncle, related in one way or another to Boland, almost fainted. He told Boland he, Boland, would not be doing that any longer. This incident calls out for Saul Bellow. He would have the prop. He would have the power to decipher what my cousin Boland was being put up to, and Bellow surely, having run into scores, if not hundreds, of Chicagoans just like the Chicagoan Boland became would have been able to chart Boland's path to a position in the Chicago Parks Commission. Wandering Chicago's loop, playing stickball in either Carbondale or Chicago, or writing to his young nephew of the passing of his wife, Boland always gripped Sharon's coin in his hand. He had no heirs. He sent me coin after coin, Franklin on a fifty-cent piece, the new Eisenhower dollar, Lady Liberty on the dime, the silver dollar, or whichever token of the realm the Republic chose temporarily to place her. She is missing from our coinage now. O oh, youthful bride of the Irish heart of an orphaned soul! The boatman arrives, always.